Morning, Najee. Morning, Gary. How are you? Very well, yourself? Good, good, good. I'm very surprised today. Raining in Bahrain, not yep. something I've experienced much of. Feels like Dublin, yeah? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, Prof, I obviously know you quite well now, but for the purpose of this, can you give us a bit about your background or kind of how you've, how you've landed here? Yep, so I'm uh, from Lebanon, uh, but then after high school, I moved to Dublin. Okay. So I went to RCSI in Dublin. I stayed, uh, I went to medical school, then I did my internship, and then I moved to the US where I did my training. So I'm an endocrinologist. Uh, I did all my training and then I worked in Philadelphia for several years. Uh, and then came back to RCSI in Bahrain, so a uh, great place to be back in. Okay, since 2018, is that correct? 2018, that's ah, right. Okay, and I suppose when I was looking up this this morning, you probably have the longest job title of anybody in RCSI Bahrain. We've got consult consultant endocrinologist, acting head of internal medicine at King Hamad University Hospital, associate professor of medicine at RCSI Bahrain, and deputy head of School of Medicine at RCSI Bahrain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it keeps me busy. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's that different, uh, different things that I do that keeps it very exciting. Yeah. Okay. So still yeah. enjoying it. Uh, yeah, I love it. It's that, like, it literally is that combination. And that's what I enjoyed in the US is being able to do different things. And then coming back to Bahrain, I think it gave me that opportunity to stay active clinically, but then be involved in uh, the college. So that's Fantastic. nice. Fantastic. So you've been here, Gary, for eight years, right? Eight years now, yeah, yeah. yeah. I came for two, and it's it's eight years now. I think that's on. the common theme. Oh, yeah. People come to Bahrain, <laughs> Absolutely. they come for a couple of years, and then they end up uh, much longer, right? Yeah, so eight years in Bahrain, following six years in RCSI Dublin before that. So how was that transition? So yeah, fantastic. Um, I, I actually hadn't heard of Bahrain before I joined RCSI in, uh, back in oh, 2010 and um, gave me a fantastic opportunity to kind of see a different part of the world. I had a great opportunity while I was working in RCSI Dublin to come out and visit the Kingdom of Bahrain on a number of occasions. Fell in love with the people, fell in love with the lifestyle, fell in love with the weather, and uh, an opportunity came up uh, eight years ago for myself and my wife and my young daughter. And, and you were in HR and human resources there, right? I did. I was a HR business partner for the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences in RCSI Dublin for six years. So built up a really good relationship with kind of faculty. We had an opportunity to look at different areas of RCSI, be Dublin, Bahrain, Malaysia, and just really get a sense of the impact that we make in three different continents. Hmm. And so that's amazing. Maybe tell us a bit about uh, HR here in Bahrain, how that's going, how we develop uh, faculty here, what we do to help them and support them. Yeah, so I suppose our, um, our focus in relation to recruitment has really been on ensuring that we have the highest quality people, whether that's in faculty, whether that's in operational roles, etc. And you know, I'm really proud of uh, the people that I work with, but also the colleagues that we have across the wider university. Um, on our faculty side, we have about 58 faculty now, um, ranging from lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor and professor. And we've introduced a new clinical educator model a couple of years ago, and that's really enhanced the delivery of things like clinical simulation and bedside teaching. And supported by that, we have probably about 175 part-time clinicians that are full-time consultants based in our teaching hospitals. Yep, keeps you, I know, very, very busy. Oh, but, yeah, uh, but really interesting, really, yeah. really interesting. And I suppose from our perspective, uh, we have a really good mix of, or varied mix of nationalities, levels, etc. I think we have 27 different nationalities in headcount of 230 people. Um, and, uh, you know, I think 78% of our faculty currently have a PhD or an exit fellowship. So it really shows the quality of delivery of the faculty. Um, for us, that's crucially important. As you know, we deliver the same curriculum in medicine across Dublin and Bahrain. Um, so the outcome has to be kind of meet the same criteria. Absolutely. And I think that's one thing about this trans medical, uh, transnational medical education. So talk to me about that, okay? Because yes. we talk a lot about transnational education and what does that mean for a senior academic like yourself? So I, I really believe that the way RCSI does it is exactly what transnational medical education is supposed to mean. It's a buzzword that a lot of places use, but here it truly reflects that. So we deliver the same curriculum. Mm -hmm. So there's a new curriculum that's been introduced. So that curriculum has been developed by both Bahrain 
and by Dublin. So we're partners in this. We meet regularly to make sure that the curriculum is being, it was developed appropriately, but being implemented in exactly the same way. So say there's a lecture in Dublin that's mm -hmm. being delivered. The same lecture is delivered in Bahrain. It was done in court between, it was developed by faculty here and they're working together to be able to deliver that. Even the exams happen on the same time and same day to make sure that when a student is graduating from Dublin, we can say they graduated with the same standards in the Bahrain. So it's exactly uh, the same in that perspective. Uh, in terms of, uh, so yeah, so I think it's, there's in terms of faculty development, we make sure that the faculty are very similar. We have faculty who are seconded from uh, Dublin here. So we work very closely with them. And I think that's one thing we could say about COVID is, uh, uh, which the only positive that can <laughs> come out from COVID is you, it's so easy now to connect with colleagues in Dublin. It's mm. as if I know that I now a lot of them are my friends because we talk on a regular basis. Mm. Uh, and it's that opportunity with, uh, and that makes the trans, uh, transnational medical education stronger because it's exactly the same. And that's fantastic. And that's, I think that's one of the key differentiators, but one of our key kind of uh, benefits. We've got the International Education Forum in June. What does that mean to you? That it's a fantastic opportunity. So faculty from from Bahrain go to Dublin. There's also faculty from, from Malaysia that go to mm -hmm. Dublin. We all meet there and it's an opportunity to meet in person, yeah. uh, to get to know the people there, but then also talk about what's coming, what we're planning, talk about different research opportunities, collaborative opportunities. Uh, we have pe external uh, stakeholders who come, who also give us lectures, who teach us. So it's, uh, it's an opportunity to really mingle uh, with different people from around the world. So uh, definitely a fantastic opportunity. Excellent, excellent. So, and then in terms of how do we keep our staff up to date in terms of their training and qualifications here? So I know a lot of the educators. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the great things about working in an academic institution is the focus on continuous professional development. We're really lucky to have a professional development unit in-house, um, which focuses on everything from academic qualifications to attendance at conferences, to more professional skills, whether that's leadership skills, communication skills, etc. So we work directly with staff across the board. We've just completed a training needs analysis and that will really help us design what the strategy looks like for 2024. Where are the areas that we need to focus on? We have a universal license to a platform called LinkedIn Learning. And as you said, as we went through that COVID kind of transition, that ability to look at online learning platforms or online communication platforms became much more pre mm -hmm. prevalent. So staff now in their own time can look at things and it takes away that classroom training for things like Excel skills or technical skills. We can really design processes around that. Um, for our faculty, it's really kind of looking at developing um, both their own academic criteria, but also things like teaching and learning skills. So we've just gone through another round of advanced HE fellowship and been really successful in relation to driving the faculty to complete the advanced mm -hmm. HE fellowship, really strengthening the quality and delivery of our teaching and learning uh, resources on campus, which obviously has a knock on yeah. benefit to the student experience. So that's been one of the main focuses is ensuring that all of our faculty have a formalized teaching qualification. So I, I think this is this fits perfectly because we we're practicing exactly what we're preaching. We tell our students yeah. this is a lifelong education that you need to be continuously. You don't stop when you graduate from medical school, and it's just, it's amazing when we see faculty and staff doing the same thing here. So it's really important for their professional growth, but also for the university, like yeah. you said. And I think it's the only it's the only organization I've ever worked in where people are knocking on your door. They want to go and do qualifications. They want to go and do things like doctorates. And we're actually supporting, I think, several staff at the moment in relation to completing their professional doctorate, which is obviously a key component of their own career, career, career progression in relation to transitioning through things like academic promotion. Yeah. So RCSI in Bahrain opened in 2004. I know our relationship in the region kind of established way before that, but can you tell us a little bit about what was the driving factor for us opening a campus in the Kingdom of Bahrain? Absolutely. So uh, it's like you said, is we have historic ties. So Bahrain and uh, RCSI have really long ties. It's from the 1960s, 1970s, yeah. where uh, RCSI used to come out to Bahrain and do the membership exams and the fellowship exams. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when 
people come, they you make friends. Mm. And what's interesting, what's nice is a lot of these people ended up going, a lot, a lot of people from Bahrain went to Ireland to, yes. to medical school. And then they come back, they did their training, they came back to Bahrain, they are involved in uh, senior positions in healthcare. Mm. Uh, and at some point, because they've seen how good it was, they mm. said, uh, like, what can we do in Bahrain to develop this further? Uh, so I think that was the opportunity to bring uh, RCSI uh, to Bahrain. It's a win-win situation for mm. everyone. Uh, it's good for Bahrain for developing healthcare. It's good for the students, and it's good for RCSI. So it allows this diverse aspect, the multicultural aspect, uh, a faculty from different places, developing healthcare needs in different places. Mm. Uh, and now it's reflecting that because our graduates from RCSI of Bahrain are going all over the world. So. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, definitely, it was a I think a strategic move, which was fantastic for Bahrain and for RCSI. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the key differences I've seen over the last couple of years is a lot of our faculty of graduates of RCSI Bahrain are now acting in a teaching role, whether it's in a faculty type position of that clinical educator position or as part of the teaching staff in the clinical settings. It's just fantastic to see you bringing that kind absolutely. of full circle. It's wonderful because I've seen now consultants at, for yeah. example, KHUH or BDF who graduated, for, they were one of the first classes to graduate <laughs> from here, and now are coming back and they're consultants and are teaching our students. I think that just tells, it's a great opportunity for students to see these people, they've seen where they, how they've developed, learn from them. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing to see, yeah. For me, in the sense of, uh, as I said, I had a really amazing opportunity to visit Bahrain yeah. a number of times during my role in RCSI Dublin. Um, and, it gave me an opportunity to kind of look at it from a lifestyle perspective as much as a career perspective. Um, and moving out here in 2016 has been life changing for my family, has been life changing for, for me in development and, and, and from a career perspective. So really enjoyable. So we go for the surprise envelopes. Oh. <laughs> this way. <laughs> so this is a photo of me, and this is a photo, photo of you. Me. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so I believe this is me at the Staff Awards with two laptops in front of me. Um, we have an annual Staff Awards ceremony, which is a really good opportunity for us to formalize, rec formally recognize not just the winners of various different awards, but actually just celebrate the achievements of all of our staff throughout the previous 12 months. It's a time to kind of just sit back, reflect, uh, get together in an informal manner, mm -hmm. an informal session. And um, so yeah, this, this award ceremony, I think was a couple of years ago. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very much behind the scenes there, kind of working on my technical skills. I remember that being quite stressful of making sure the right slides came on, on screen at the right time. So mine is the white coat ceremony speech, which uh, I gave, uh, and that was, uh, I loved it. Uh, I'm preparing the speech, so trying to say like, how can I inspire these uh, medical students? Uh, and it just gives you an opportunity to reflect back yeah. on your career and what you, how you got there, put yourself in the students' shoes. Uh, but what was nice is the students now are in the new curriculum. Yeah. I've been involved in teaching them, so it was nice to see how, it's, it really is, was the first time that I got to work with first and year, second year medical students. Okay. And what would be nice now is I see them also transition to see them in the clinic, in the same hospitals, yeah. and how, like over two years, you can see them, how they grow, uh, so I got my children to watch it as well. They got bored for a bit, but then, <laughs> <laughs> but then I think it was nice to see them. It, like it, they were proud of seeing me uh, giving this speech uh, to to see if I can inspire the Absolutely. medical students. Yeah. So that was nice. And what is the white coat ceremony? So the white coat ceremony is basically when medical students are transitioning from learning from lectures mm -hmm. from the campus and going to the uh, hospital. So yeah. it's now their opportunity. They put on their gowns oh, okay. and now they're start of their clinical career when they go to the hospitals. So okay. it's a really uh, like a pivotal move, a moment in their career. It, it's something to be very proud of. They're done from their foundational sciences and they're moving on to their clinical sciences. Uh, to the clinical part, so it's a proud, proud day. So okay. a lot of parents were there. It was nice to talk to the parents and to the families because a lot of this is it's very like it's it's 
as taxing on the medical students as it is on their parents. So it's a lot of hard Absolutely. work to get them to where they are. So it's nice to see them in this proud moment. Okay, so you've gone full circle. You've gone from being in that white coat ceremony as Absolutely. a student of RCSI to actually giving the yep. speech and, and, and transitioning yep. students. I remember one of my parents were there and my mom got very emotional. So it's nice to see that over time. So, Fantastic. Yep.